All right, everyone, if you are hallway tracking it right now in the center area, please step outside into the stadium seats to the actual hallway track. We are now going to have a talk by these two gentlemen about deploying an event stream in a microservice application. One of the communication patterns between services, right? Yes, it is. Ah, complexity for us. Woo! All right, so without further ado, let's do it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm JJ Viegas. I'm an IBM WebSphere uh, developer. I joined IBM about a year and a half. Uh, my team's in charge of Gradle and Maven plugins. And on the side, we also get to uh, work with a lot of moder modern technologies and adding them to some older, some, uh, some newer uh, applications. So. And I'm Kevin Lau. Uh, I've been with IBM WebSphere Liberty for three, almost four years. I actually spent three years on front-end development and the past half year or so uh, on our integration team. Yeah, and we're both recent UT grads, so it's kind of nice to be back here. <laughs> yeah, so before we jump into the event stream service application, we wanted to talk a bit about the entire microservice application. And uh, just a warning, it's not about IBM tech. This is uh, things you can apply, but we just happen to use IBM tech in our, uh, in our development process. So IBM Stock Trader, uh, you can think of it uh, as a sample brokerage application, simple, uh, similar to Robinhood, buy, sell stock. Um, there's a portfolio and things like that. Um, we add a microservice we'll talk about right now, um, but it uses a lot of modern technologies. Uh, some you, you're familiar with, Kubernetes and Helm. We use an event stream that's built on top of Apache Kafka, and we also use Open Liberty which is just a open source Java EE server and the microprofile uh, framework, which uh, we'll discuss later on in the talk. But uh, th this is the entire application as a whole. And you've probably seen uh, microservice architectures like this all the time. I'm sure you've seen several throughout the past couple of days. But uh, this is the application we dealt with. As Somewhat complex, uses a lot of IBM technologies, but like I said, it uses a lot of open source uh, alternatives as well. And specifically for uh, Kevin and I, we were tasked with uh, adding the trade history application, which is the bottom left-hand corner. Um, it consumes, it acts as a consumer in the event stream and persists data on a Mongo database. So how many of you are familiar with event streams? Looks like maybe a third, some of you. Uh, okay, anyways, so for those of you unfamiliar with event streams, here's a simple diagram, uh, just showing a really simple flow between the producers and the consumers. Um, so we have at the top producers, which are just applications that can generate uh, content and data, and it'll send it into a topic in the event stream. Uh, from the event stream, we have uh, consumers uh, that grab the data, and they can just do whatever they want with it. Um, we're going to skip over some of the more complex topics, such as connectors or stream processors, uh, because in our application, we just wanted to focus on a simple publisher-subscriber model, where we just have um, an application creating events and one application consuming events. Yeah, so as Kevin mentioned, we follow a producer-consumer model where uh, the portfolio acts a pro as a producer, producing events that uh, goes to the event stream, uh, the event stream uh, holding onto those events until consumer consumes them, uh, depending on the topic. In our case, it's just a one-to-one -one correspondence. We use a uh, one-topic system and persists that to a Mongo database and at a later time aggregates that data and exposes it through a REST API. So I keep saying events, and events uh, in this case consist of um, either a stock buy or sell, and uh, contains data that uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the stock market concepts, just uh, buying of this, uh, the, the share price at time of purchase, the time of purchase, um, who bought it, things like things you want to uh, keep track of. Uh, at a later time, uh, through the REST API, we pull in th these events and um, we return things of value based off of that data. Um, one example uh, that most of us in the stock market uh, 
are in there in the first place for is a return on investment. So you can just think of our API exposing um, things of value like that. So um, like I showed in the earlier slide, these uh, technology, the, those technologies, you were probably already familiar with Kubernetes and Helm. That's what I've seen most people uh, that have been talking about. Um, I just wanted to talk about Open Liberty and MicroProfile. Open Liberty is just a lightweight Java EE server. That's all you really have to be aware of. It's uh, fully Java EE 8 compliant, and it's um, friendly with the MicroProfile initiative. And the MicroProfile initiative is an uh, Eclipse started foundation supported by a few large companies like IBM to try to make uh, Java EE development easier, so uh, for microservice specifically. So here's our um, overview of kind of our development and deployment process. Uh, we just wanted to share our experience um, starting from just starting from our uh, development going into deploying to the cloud. Uh, we'll also touch upon uh, what we did and what we ran across in deploying and testing, uh, especially for our Mongo database. And we'll also uh, mention a little bit about MicroProfile and what helped us there. So before we continue, I want to emphasize that we are dev first. Uh, we, uh, we do operations. We do maintain and deploy our Maven and Gradle plugins as part of the team. But uh, we're, just to let you know, we're seeing this from a developer perspective first. All right, so to start off um, just developing our application. Uh, so we used IBM Event Streams, and luckily for us, IBM Event Streams also provides a generated starter application, uh, which already provided some of the boilerplate code uh, for connecting to our event streams. So we really just had to focus on developing um, our REST endpoints and just interfacing with our Mongo database. Uh, making sure we're storing all the data we need to and uh, aggregating all the data for our REST endpoint. So once we had all of that up and running, of course, the next step for getting ready to deploy to the cloud is to containerize our application. Uh, the starter application also provided a Docker file. Um, so it wasn't too much work. Just had to make a few changes here and there. And our, con our application was ready for running in Docker pretty quickly. Uh, from containerizing, uh, having it run in Docker, we're then pretty much ready to run it in Kubernetes. Uh, the starter application also came with the Helm chart, so that wasn't too much work. Uh, and this is where things started to get interesting. So we deploy with Helm, uh, deploy to our IBM Cloud instance, uh, and we're actually able to get it up and running pretty much without any problems. Uh, we're able to consume from the event streams. Uh, everything works. Uh, along the way, we were also working with a couple of other uh, development teams who wanted to demo our trade history project, which was consuming from the event streams. So we worked with them in deploying our application to a couple other cloud environments, uh, or a couple other instances of cloud environments. And we realized something wasn't working we weren't able to connect to the event streams. Uh, it took us a while to figure out why, uh, but it turns out we had a configuration file which came packaged with the starter application, uh, which was meant for connecting with that first instance of the event streams that we worked with. So essentially, our configuration file uh, with our credentials for event streams was packaged together with the application, which is not good for a cloud deployed um, application. And so we needed to find a way to make it, um, to separate the configuration from our application and have it live in the cloud environment. So we're able to deploy anywhere. We don't have to repackage for a different instance of a environment. Um, and you can just easily change the secret as you need uh, whenever you're deploying to a new environment. So we discovered Kubernetes Secrets. Um, Kubernetes Secrets is an easy way to let you store and manage sensitive information in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, and working with it is pretty simple. Uh, we just create a YAML file and just give the type secret. Uh, and here we named our secret uh, Kafka for connecting to our Kafka event stream. 
Uh, and in the data field, you just provide some of the things that you need, such as the API key and the URL. And all these are base64 encoded as per Kubernetes standard. Not too sure what security that actually provides, but we assume it's all good. Um, so yeah, once, once you have that YAML file, uh, you, you've generated your API key, you base64 encoded it, you stored it into your secret, uh, then you just apply it to your Kubernetes environment with this uh, kubectl apply and then your YAML file. So that's all up and running. Um, the next step, you want your application to actually be able to use those secrets. And in order to do that, uh, we just have to bind some environment variables to those secrets. Uh, so in your deployment in YAML, you just specify uh, you have your name. So in, in our example here, we have our event stream URL. That's our environment variable. Uh, and then we tell it to access the Kafka secret and the key called the URL. And from there, you have your secret bound to your environment variable, and your application can then use that environment variable. So at this point, we can easily change our secrets. Uh, no matter where we deploy, you just create a new secret in whatever new environment, and you're able to connect to the Kafka event streams without having to repackage the application like we had to in the past. So that all seems good. Um, but if you recall, going back to the previous slide, that was quite a bit of work uh, generating our secrets. You have to first go to your service, uh, get the API key. From there, you have to encode it, put it into a file, apply it to your environment. So along the way, we discovered <laughs> Kubernetes service catalog. Um, and this, is, this was really helpful for us, especially deploying to multiple different environments. So service catalog interfaces with a service broker, which manages external services. Uh, and just, it just helps you bind to the services without having to do too much manual configuration. So in our case, the service catalog talked with uh, the service broker which had an instance of IBM event streams. And it managed the binding, uh, the generation of the secret that we made earlier. And it just creates the secret for us, um, so we don't have to do it all manually. And Trade History is able to access that same secret to use the, uh, to use the information that we need to connect to Kafka. So this is kind of the final, um, I guess, the architecture. Uh, so we have our service catalog, which is uh, communicating with event streams through the service broker. And the service catalog generates the secret for us, so we don't have to do all that tedious work. And our trade history application is able to use the secret and connect to event streams. Yeah, so one more thing of note here is uh, secrets provide a great way, similar to config map, to uh, bind your properties to environment variables regardless of the deployment. So uh, based off of that, you configure some properties in your config, I mean, in your uh, Helm chart, it'll pull them in as environment variables. It's great for string value pair matching. In our case, there was also a search.jks file that uh, was needed in order to authenticate with the event stream. So. Um, we binded it as uh, bounded as a secret, and we even though we needed it as a file. So even though it's kind of a straightforward process, it's something that most applications at some point will need a file of some sorts. And uh, especially if you want to uh, deploy it as a secret, then you need to worry about uh, us setting up the vo volume mount. Uh, at the bottom, you can see us created the volume mount, uh, binding it to the directory, and uh, setting it to read only. Once you mount it, then you can, uh, from your application, you could just reach that directory and a search uh, file should be available to you. So just, just uh, an added step when dealing with, uh, specifically with files. So at this point, uh, we, th that was the gist of connecting to the events from configuring the files. And uh, we also deployed to the Mongo database and I'm sure most of us have already deployed and if you're, you haven't, if you're familiar with Helm and, uh, it's a straightforward process. We deployed on our instance of IBM Cloud Private, which is just a Kubernetes environment. So I, I don't want to spend too much, I'm not going to spend any time talking about the deployment itself. 
uh, it's a publicly available Helm chart. You bind, uh, create the VM, you bind a persistent volume, and you, you have the Mongo deployment up and running. What I did want to mention is um, I'm not sure, um, well, I'm sure if you've dealt with MongoDB deployments, you've uh, had to deal with integration testing as well. And this was my first real project uh, dealing with deploying the Mongo database and creating tests for it as well. And when I uh, researched, I noticed that I was limited in terms of options. I could test on my product, production environment, which for obvious reasons we want to avoid. We could test in a deployment environment, which can uh, get expensive. You ha you're dedicating resources for that. And, um, or we could just mock. And at least for me, we were limited in a time span of uh, about two months to finish this project. So after development and adding tests, uh, it looked like mocking wasn't going to be as trivial as we thought it'd be. So we came across this Embed Maven plugin. It's a plug for <laughs> someone on GitHub at this point. It's, uh, we, we are not associated. It's, it's actually a wrapper for another plugin called uh, uh, from the Flap Dude organization. So um, we'll, uh, we can provide more information on that later. But our, our project uh, is built using Maven. So it's a uh, Java E project uh, built using Maven. And Thankfully, uh, if, if you're not familiar with Maven, it goes through, it has uh, life cycle phases that you could bind goals to. So um, there's a pre-integration test phase, which is a phase that's supposed to prepare for when tests do occur. And uh, after adding the plugin, configuring some properties, we are actually given an instance to a Mongo database for only the integration test phase. So at startup, it goes up, and uh, during that test phase, our test can add data, can test the endpoints and make sure that's working. And then uh, once that's done, it'll actually close down and clean up the resources for you. So uh, it's a really useful plugin. It's, um, it's what I found from my research on Stack Overflow. So <laughs> I'm open to any other suggestions or any other alternatives at a, at a after the talk, if, if you'd like to talk to me. But for us, it was a great, uh, easy way to add tests without having to worry much about configuration. So we spoke about the microprofile spec. And to reiterate, microprofile isn't specific to IBM. It isn't an IBM tech. It's an open source Java EE initiative uh, to make microservice development easier for, uh, for Java EE appli applications. So we implemented a help config and open API feature in our uh, Liberty server. And um, have, how many of you have heard of the micro profile spec? Just curious. Yeah, so I figured only a couple. But um, it's, it's actually similar to Spring pr Framework, where it makes microservice development uh, kind of boilerplate, where you don't have to worry about adding a health check or a configuration. It's kind of, if you follow this standard, it's kind of added and you can focus on your development. So the first I want to talk about is a simple health endpoint. So obviously in Kubernetes, uh, you always have a health and readiness probe um, to check to make sure your application is running, whether you link that through Istio or just base Kubernetes, it checks that health endpoint. And for our application, uh, we were able to implement it just with a simple health class and uh, implement the interface and add the annotation. So our application is considered up if it can connect to Kafka and Mongo. And if that's the case, then, uh, then it'll return the status of up. Pretty simple and straightforward. But what's the value from this is um, you don't have to set up that endpoint manually. You don't have to um, work. You don't have to implement your own different uh, checks. This could be spread out to your other Java EE applications. This could be implemented very similar to where you, you can focus on development and after the fact, make sure you add your checks and you'll be great to go. And I just want to reiterate how simple it is. Um, so JJ mentioned you just create a class, you implement health check. Uh, you just also just add the at health annotation and you don't have to worry about the whole creating your own REST endpoint uh, and doing all these other things just for a simple health check. All right, so moving on to microprofile config. Um, microprofile config provides a way for you to pull in properties and environment variables from various different places. It could be um, 
system properties, environment variables, uh, configuration files. Uh, it aggregates them all together uh, and also lets you set the order of preference you want. Um, let's say you want a configuration file to override some of your environment variables. Uh, you can just set the ordinal in the configuration file and MicroProfile will see that it takes higher precedence and will override um, whatever you have already existing in the prop system properties or environment. Uh, it's really easy to use. It uses context dependency injection. Uh, so you see the add inject. And as for actually configuring the variables, you just add the at config property annotation. Uh, let's, let's use a second example here. Uh, so we have our key store. Um, we, conf we configure it to use the property called Kafka key store. Uh, so it's going to search the environment uh, for that property. And in the case that we don't have that configured, we can actually set a default value here. Uh, so yeah, in case Kafka key store doesn't exist, we'll just default to the resources security certs.jks path. And that's uh, the secret we mounted earlier through the volume. So from our application code, we could just leave it as is. And whenever you deploy uh, from here, without further configuration, it can pull in the property as an environment variable. So this is a micro profile fe feature. Locally, when we're testing, we, have a, we can have a search.jks file, and it will check the default value if it can't find an environment variable. So from just this line, we can get, and just deploying the environment variables, we can just uh, pull in the, the properties in the source code like this. And lastly, we wanted to talk upon uh, Open API. Uh, so Open API is a way to help developers document uh, REST endpoints in the code um, without having to like, pull up a separate reference document or website. So here we have an example um, with just a couple of the annotations. Uh, there are many more that you can use to document your endpoints in great detail. Uh, but here we have the API responses uh, around the middle of the screen. And you can see here we describe uh, some of our error codes um, or HTTP status codes you could get. Uh, in our case, we have the 404. Uh, we gave it a description. Oh, if you hit a 404, that means your Mongo database couldn't be found. And of course, we have the 200. Everything is good. Uh, and at the bottom here, we also have the, the at operation annotation. And over there, we just kind of provide a summary of what the REST endpoint does and also um, a more detailed description. And you can just describe it however you want. Uh, so once you have these annotations um, and you start up your application, uh, you can hit the application URL slash open API slash UI, and you'll come up with a really nice UI that just shows um, a list of all of your endpoints and all the documentation that you provided. And this is just all auto-generated from those annotations. So here you can see uh, some of what we had said earlier. You'll see the endpoint uh, with its summary, uh, with its description. And we'll also have the parameters, uh, which we did not show on the previous slide. But you can also describe your parameters and give more details about what, um, like what it needs to be just basically anything you want for documentation. Uh, also here we can see the status code that we provided in the annotations. Uh, you have the 200 and the 404 telling us that the Mongo database is not found. And some of the value of that also is uh, while the developers are uh, creating their endpoints, without having to access the source code, you do get this inherent uh, documentation of sorts. Um, from within the UI, you also have the option to test the endpoints without having to go to a Postmates, for example. So there is uh, some value here with, uh, that's given without having to actually uh, go into the source code. But you want to know the APIs. You want to know what the JSON models are through the annotations that uh, Kevin mentioned earlier. So that's the end-to-end uh, -end journey and kind of like our solution and um, what we ended up doing in order to fix the these problems we hit. Um, yeah. So we're still we're still fairly new to Kubernetes and just 
DevOps in general. Um, yeah, these these were how we solved our problems uh, and some of the things that we ran into. Uh, we hope you learn something from this, and we're always open to learn. So if you had any suggestions, we're open to hear. Yeah. Thank you. We have quite a bit of time for questions and, and suggestions for Kevin and Juan. Okay, okay then, Kevin. Oh, you got a, you got a mic, Bradley. I got a mic right here. So um, yeah, I've done some Mongo stuff, and there's some plugins in a lot of the um, the CI systems like Travis and Jenkins. Um, where you can just boot up a Mongo database, you know, inject some data in it, and then after your build runs, it deletes it. So that's how I do a lot of uh, integration testing with mm -hmm. Mongo. Uh, so yeah, check that out. Uh, that was that saved me a bunch of times. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, good, good, good stuff. Other comments for Kevin and Juan? All right then. Re please remember, uh, lunch is down here. Ernest, you wanted me to say something? <laughs> 